We have some uh, questions from our new Facebook group. It's called Facts Not Fear. And Cindy Roberts wants to know how long after you are exposed to an infected person will it take before you know that you're infected or maybe you have symptoms? Yep, so the 50% uh, of people will have symptoms by day five after exposure, and the majority of people will have symptoms by day 12. And that's where that 14-day quarantine period really comes from, because by 14 days, pretty much everyone who's going to have symptoms goes ahead and has them. So usually by day five, but definitely by day 12. But the caveat to that is, again, that there is some percentage of people that will never have symptoms again. And that can be some adults too, in addition to the kids. So you could be exposed, you could be shedding it in your respiratory droplets and then, you know, never really develop the symptoms of the virus itself. One of our Facebook group members is Jessica Jensen and she wants to know, is it true that this virus is more deadly because it originates from an animal and humans have not built up an immunity to it, like say the flu? Yes. So the virus is about 10 to 30 times as deadly as the, the regular flu. It's not necessarily more deadly because it originates from an animal. It's, you know, deadly based on the complication rate and the way that it affects your body. So it's not necessarily the fact that it's originated from an animal that's making it deadly. That's just how the virus works. The fact that it originated from an animal and we don't have immunity to it is what's causing it to spread so quickly. So that's what's contributing to the worldwide spread that we've seen but not so much to the mortality rate, which is a function of the virus itself. Do we know that it came from bats in China, or is that just something some people are saying? No, actually, that's been scientifically proven. They've looked at the genetics of the virus, so it's been fully genetically sequenced, and it has a homology or similarity to bats. It's about 75 to 80 percent identical to the SARS virus, you know, which had an outbreak in 2002 to 2003, and that one has also originated in a similar host animal. But we do believe there was an intermediary animal. So even though bats were the original host, we don't think there were any bats at that Wuhan seafood market where the virus originated, so there was probably an intermediary animal between the bats and the humans. Now would that animal have to have been alive or was it something there cut up say for meat? It's hard to know. It's hard to know exactly how that jump happened from that intermediary animal to humans. Was it a respiratory droplet or was it blood particles or was it feces? It's, it's difficult. We don't have that answer at this point. You brought up feces. We talked about respiratory droplets. Can it be transferred through feces like bad bathroom habits? Yes, and a study just came out, in fact, two days ago that says that there is some possibility of fecal oral spread. And what that means is if you go to the bathroom and, you know, don't wash your hands properly and then you prepare somebody's food and they consume that food or you touch utensils where their food is going to go, that can certainly cause some level of transmission of the virus. We also saw in Hong Kong and some parts of China where they don't have sanitary sewage systems that when people, you know, that were infected with the virus went to the bathroom and then flushed, there's possible that small fecal particles got aerosolized and then those were inhaled and that was possibly a mode of transmission as well. Now we talked about point, that we're to not toilet plume thing yesterday so we know what you're talking toilet about. I'm sorry, plume. you were going to finish yeah. that one sentence. At this I was point, just going to say that we don't know uh, whether the blood is infectious. We do, do know that viral particles are found in blood but we don't know whether blood itself is considered to be infectious if you come into contact with it. So let's talk about Florida. Andrea Horbert has a really good question. Florida has decided to close all bars and nightclubs. They're just closed. They're shut down. Restaurants at this point, though, are still open. We know that could change, but she wants to know, wouldn't it be just as spreadable in a restaurant? Yes, absolutely, yes. So tell her thank you for that question, because in my opinion, until we do what's called aggressive social distancing, meaning we really just, you know, stop putting people in close proximity together, it, this is not going to work. And this virus spreads from people. It doesn't spread by itself. So it needs people and people's behavior to spread it. And the way that people's behavior spreads it is just by coming into close proximity. So someone doesn't even necessarily have to cough or sneeze on you. It could just be that they're talking um, animatedly and there's small saliva particles that may get aerosolized into the air and then you could breathe those in. So even just being in a restaurant that's crowded could certainly increase your risk for you know catching the virus and for spreading it around the community. So in my opinion aggressive social distancing at this point with the rapid increase that we've seen in the US cases really needs to happen. So some of the restaurants are trying to say okay we're not going to have so much focus on dining in we're going to deliver more, even restaurants that normally yeah. don't deliver. 
But that, to be honest, makes me uncomfortable because I don't know at what point you think, well, somebody was preparing that food and they dropped a bag off. Right. Even if somebody drops the bag off at your door and you don't have any interaction with the delivery person, that delivery system, the dropping off of the food at your door, does yeah. that worry you? Yeah. It does worry me, and we don't at this point know how much that risk is. So we know that there's a higher risk of getting takeout or delivery compared to cooking at home because the food and the utensils have been under your direct control at all times. But I can't really quantify that risk at this point. I mean, it's challenging because we want to support our local restaurants that are closing in this difficult time. But at the same time, I would say it's probably the safest option to prepare your own food at home because you know exactly where it went and who contacted it and how it was, it was prepared. Let's talk about clothes and shoes. I've been hearing that question a lot. Our viewers are asking when I get home, should I take off my shoes and leave them in the garage? Uh, yes, actually that is that is a good practice in general because the bottom of the shoes are, you know, a hard surface and we know the virus likes to stick to harder surfaces more than softer surfaces and can last longer. Now, how long it can last really depends on how much virus particle was on there and the temperature and all of those types of things. But since you're not regularly wiping the bottom of your shoes, you don't know if you've been in the bathroom, if there have been fecal splatters or anything else that could have contaminated your shoes with potential viral particles, it's a great idea. Just take them off in the garage and, you know, that way you keep the floors in your house clean because inadvertently if you touch the floor or drop something and pick it up you know you could certainly increase your risk in that fashion. What about taking off your clothes? Some moms are asking well when my kids come home from well school's out now but should children take off their clothes before they mingle with the rest of the family or even adults from say if they're still working their jobs? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, certainly higher risk groups. So if you're, if you're a healthcare worker, for example, I strongly recommend that you take off your clothes at the door and keep them in the, in the, you know, in the foyer or the laundry room or somewhere separate from the rest of the family because that's an important thing to do. But if you're, for example, just going to the supermarket or, you know, going to the pharmacy to pick up what you need and you haven't had less than six to eight feet of contact, it's not necessary really to completely take off your clothes. Now if somebody coughed or sneezed on you and you're concerned that they might be contaminated, I would certainly take them off at the door. I would wash them right away. Regular washing, nothing special. But just be sure not to put them back in the same basket because certainly that basket can get contaminated as well, especially if it's made of plastic or laundry basket. So you just have to be real careful and mindful again of everything that it's coming into contact with. Now that raises a question. If you have a sneeze, if you have respiratory droplets from somebody else on your shirt and you're worried about that. I mean, in my case, I might just throw it out if I could, but doesn't it have to be 140, 150 degrees to kill this virus? Is that correct? And wouldn't a wash machine not do that? Yeah, so I, I'm not aware of that data in terms of the temperature that kills the virus, but one of the ways in which washing your hands is effective is to actually get the viral particles off the surface. So, you know, washing your hands doesn't actually kill the virus, it just gets those germs off of our hands and in the same way washing your clothes actually will get those germs off of the clothes with the friction and the detergent. So it's probably not necessary to throw out your clothes at this point um, but it's certainly important to wash them like I said and make sure you put them in the dryer and that heat will certainly help as well if there's any other bacteria because heat is definitely beneficial in, in, in killing bacteria as well. Let me ask you about some ways that people might be able to boost their immune system right now and if that would help at all. Would okay. zinc help you? Yep, so there are several vitamins and micronutrients that are involved in our immune system. So it's easy to remember, it's actually vitamin A, B, C, D, and E zinc, iron, and selenium. And those are kind of the key components of the things that fight our immune system. And what we know about these vitamins and minerals is that if you have a deficiency, whether it's because you're not eating a well-balanced diet or because you've had gastric bypass surgery or because you have a inflammatory bowel disease, any number of reasons, but if you have a deficiency of any of these vitamins or minerals, it can impair your immune system and increase your susceptibility to infections. But the flip side is not necessarily true, which means Means that taking mega doses of the vitamins and nutrients is not necessarily going to boost your immune system if otherwise you have a pretty well balanced diet and you're not vitamin deficient and actually it can be toxic so there's certain vitamins that in high doses can actually be toxic or harmful to your health so what I would say is if you are at risk for a, you know 
a deficiency of vitamins or nutrients, then talk to your doctor about whether you need supplementation. In China right now, they are doing a clinical trial of high dose intravenous vitamin C to see if they can kind of augment the immune response for people that have advanced stages of this disease. So the ones that are in ventilator and just not doing well. The results of that trial are still pending, so we don't know what it actually shows. But in the short term, my best advice for keeping your immune system healthy would be to limit the amount of alcohol you're drinking. So don't drink excess alcohol, which can be hard at a time like this. Make sure you're getting enough sleep, enough exercise, and keep those stress levels down because stress is actually a cortisol hormone actually suppresses your immune system as well. That's kind of easy to say, of course, and you're offering good advice. But people are getting more and more stressed as this goes on. So let's talk about a stressful position, a caregiver. Let's say somebody in your house is under quarantine because they've been exposed mm -hmm. and they've tested positive for coronavirus. What on earth does that caregiver do in that same house? Yeah, great question. So the first and most important thing is to sort of isolate that person within the home. So sort of create almost like a hospital environment where there's one bedroom and one bathroom that that person is exclusively using that the other individuals in the family are not necessarily you know, interacting with if, if that's possible. The next thing to do is if you're taking care of them, make sure that you are wearing gloves and that you're wearing a mask and they're wearing a mask when you're interacting with them. So we talk a lot about masks not being effective, but in a situation where somebody has known or suspected coronavirus infection, that's when we really ask that infected person to wear the mask so that their respiratory droplets don't get transmitted to others. And then anytime you go in and out of their room, again, you want to wash your hands real carefully. You want to be sure that you limit the number of caregivers. So you don't want five or six or seven people going in and out of there, visiting with them and things like that. You want to make sure that it's really just one person. That's kind of the primary person who's following these precautions. You also want to make sure that the infected person is not interacting with their pets. So as far as we know, this virus doesn't infect animals, the, the COVID-19 virus, but the CDC does advise that the infected person not be the primary caregiver for the pets because it's possible, um, you know, that something uncertain could emerge in the future and we could know that the pets might be at higher risk. Do we think that the coronavirus could live in the fur of a dog? Um, so we don't know so much about the fur of the dog, but we do know that coronavirus is a, a family of viruses, some of which actually infect dogs and cats. So there's actually a coronavirus vaccine for dogs. Now, that's not the same coronavirus as the one we're talking about, which is called the SARS coronavirus 2. That's the name of this virus that's causing the human epidemic. That's believed to mainly infect humans. But coronavirus is actually a family of viruses that belongs to an animal virus family. So it originally actually mostly infects animals and that's the reason for those heightened precautions but dogs have been known to contract strains of coronavirus different from the strain that we're currently talking about this is a really important question for us because right across the street from our tv station in fact and at several other locations they are setting up drive-through testing uh, it started mm -hmm. in one location these others will start up sometimes this week so these symptoms are tough because it's not like you have severe pain in your head and you know gee that might be coronavirus they could be flu, they could be just bronchitis or something else. How do you know that you're like, I think I should get tested? I know you're supposed to talk to your doctor, but a lot of people don't want to go to the doctor's office or even try to make those phone calls. At what, what do you decide? What are the exact symptoms, exact number of fever, temperature ratings, or whatever you want to call that? How do you know when you should get tested? Yep, so um, another important question, especially because it's allergy season too and people can have allergies and such as well. So I, I generally tend to say allergies and colds are the neck up. So if it's your runny nose or your eyes are congested or maybe have a little scratchy throat, probably allergies more likely or it could be a cold. Whereas if it's neck down, meaning you have cough, shortness of breath, or you have a fever. Those are the big three that you really need to know for coronavirus. And looking at all the data that's emerged out of China, the most common symptom is cough, and then fever is the second most common, and that occurs in, a, you know, sometimes it can occur in the first week of the infection, and sometimes it can occur in the second week. So it could be a later symptom. And then 
if, if the virus is progressing and infecting your lungs, then you start to have shortness of breath. And if you have shortness of breath, then you absolutely need to talk to a medical provider about whether you need to be admitted, because that's kind of a more concerning sign. But the fever and the cough are kind of the two signs that should really tip you off. And they both don't have to occur together. You can have one, you know, you can start with just a cough, and then a few days later you'll develop the fever. But if it's any of those symptoms in the chest, like I said, from the neck down, and that's when you really start thinking about coronavirus. Now, there's a lot of overlap with the flu, and as you pointed out, and so it's difficult to know whether it's the flu or the coronavirus because there's still flu activity around. But the only way to make that distinction is with a test. Unfortunately, symptoms don't really help us to, t to tell the difference between those two.